intense diplomatic negotiations around the world to defuse tensions in Ukraine. Is it enough to prevent war in Europe? Hello, I'm Mike Walter, sitting in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. started with high-level meetings to discuss the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Here in Washington, D.C., German Chancellor Olaf Scholz met with U.S. President Joe Biden and tried to dispel fears that NATO countries were divided on how to deal with the threat. We are acting together. We are absolutely united, and we will not taking different steps. We will do the same steps, and they will be very, very hard to Russia, and they should understand. Last Friday in Beijing, Russian President Vladimir Putin met with Chinese President Xi Jinping during the start of the Winter Olympics. The two countries issued a statement opposing the expansion of NATO and demanding security guarantees in Europe. On Monday, French President Emmanuel Macron held talks with Putin in Moscow. Putin thanked Macron for France's role in dealing with the security issues in Europe. And this Tuesday, Macron went to Kiev to meet with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Philip Crowther has the tales. Well, the French President Emmanuel Macron has now left the Ukrainian capital, Kiev. On Monday, of course, he was in Moscow with the Russian President Vladimir Putin. Does he leave with a success story? Not necessarily. Diplomacy is moving very, very slowly, but it does appear to be moving a little bit with baby steps. Here's what the French President got from his two days here in Ukraine and in Russia previously. He says a pledge from Vladimir Putin to not escalate the tensions any further and a pledge to not have a permanent military presence or a permanent military base in Belarus. Now, the uh, spokesperson for Vladimir Putin came out after that. They were saying that there was no deal between France and Russia. It doesn't necessarily have to be a deal. There does seem to be a little bit of an agreement there between Putin and Macron. And that is essentially all uh, we can work with here uh, right now. Things will move slowly over the next few weeks, but possibly in the right direction. It looks like Macron is turning into a bit of a mediator here between Russia and Ukraine. The Turkish President Erdogan and wanted to have that same role. We'll have to wait and see who manages to get the two parties maybe together at the table at some point. That still feels like it's a long way off right now. So with the French president in Berlin right now, I think most eyes will stay on the German capital because on Thursday uh, there will be further talks in the so-called Normandy format to discuss the Minsk uh, agreement. Now that uh, is supposed to be uh, the peace deal between Ukraine and Russia and Germany and France and other signatories that really hasn't worked out politically so far. The good thing is you can see that Russia and Ukraine are ready to get to sit down at the same table with France and Germany uh, there as well. But there is so, so much uh, still to be done because remember that there have been eight years of war already between Ukraine and Russian-backed separatists in the southeast of the country in the Donbass region. And now, of course, add that ne next level, that next layer of complexity with those over uh, those, that enormous amount of Russian troops on the borders with Ukraine right now and more troops being added as we speak. Philip Crowther, CGTN in Kiev. To discuss what all this means, let's bring in our panel from Berlin. Paul Hockenos is a journalist and author. Joining us from Moscow, Pavel Felgenhauer is a defense analyst and columnist for Novaya Gazeta. Einar Tangen is a current affairs commentator joining us from Beijing and here in Washington, D.C. Jack Midgley is principal at Midgley and Company, a consulting firm advising governments and commercial organizations on policy issues. I want to welcome all of you to the broadcast. And Jack, let's start with you. If you watch uh, these broadcasts from Washington, these uh, cable networks, it seems like a war is imminent. They talk about uh, casualties and troop strength and the alarm bells are going off. And yet, uh, I was listening to a BBC report earlier this week. They went to a town that borders uh, Russia in Ukraine, and the people were going about their business as though nothing was going on. Uh, and then, of course, there's the headline from Foreign Policy magazine on January 28th, Ukraine urging West to chill out. Uh, the President Zelensky kind of saying, hey, tamp this down. So give me your sense. Is, is war imminent? What's your take? Anytime the, the nuclear superpowers face off, we have to be cautious. That said, the odds of a hot war uh, between the United States uh, and Russia over Ukraine, uh, those odds are practically zero. That I don't think will happen. At the same time, uh, we're hearing the strongest possible signals 
from Mr. Putin about security guarantees uh, and about the expansion of NATO that I think are survival issues for the Putin government uh, and for the Russians. And I believe that if pushed into a corner, Putin would go to war over the issue of expansion of NATO. Uh, at, all of that said, from an economic standpoint, from a political standpoint, Ukraine means very little to the United States. That sounds harsh, but it's true. There's virtually no U.S.-Ukrainian trade. Ukraine is largely without political influence. Uh, and from a U.S. standpoint, there's very little national interest at stake in Ukraine. That's not true for the Russians. And it's that calculation that I think the American administration has gotten wrong. Uh, we should not underestimate how much is at stake for Putin uh, in the future of Ukraine. Interesting take, Paul. Uh, the German chancellor in town in Washington, D.C., President uh, Biden and uh, Olaf Scholz meeting. Um, and there seems to be a different view coming out of Europe. Uh, this is a German official quoted by the Wall Street Journal. I'm going to recite it to you. The U.S. thinks Putin will do a full-blown war. Europeans think he's bluffing. Americans are preparing with the sense that it will happen. We don't. Uh, the European Union's high representative for foreign affairs had a rather nuanced take. Let's listen to what he had to say. We are living, to my understanding, the most dangerous moment for the security in Europe after the end of the Cold War. But uh, at the same time, we believe that there is still room for diplomacy. There is still room for discussing, for knowing which are the concerns of everybody, also the Russian concerns, in order to avoid the worst. So, Paul, what's your take? I think it's impossible to know uh, what Putin is going to do, and I'm not sure that he knows himself. Um, we've seen these huge masses of troops on the border, which and uh, comments about Ukraine and about the, basically the non-existence of Ukraine. Putin thinks Ukraine is uh, basically part of Russia. So you put this troop, these massive troop on um, deployments, the fact that Crimea has already been annexed and that uh, there are Russian troops and, and, and paramilitaries in the Donbass region. And he put it all together. And so this certainly is the, 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 the very real potential and, and danger of an invasion of Ukraine. I mean, I don't think that even in the worst situation there would be a full invasion of Ukraine, but perhaps an invasion of border reasons and a slicing off of more parts of Ukraine. Um, either annexing it or uh, you know, militarily um, occupying it. Uh, at the same time, I think that this would be a tremendous mistake for Mr. Putin and for Russia. I don't think that Russia would gain anything. It would alienate itself completely from the rest of Europe. It would face a, a, a military reaction from Ukraine. It would face uh, you know, crippling sanctions uh, from the West. This has been made clear. So. Um, Chancellor Schultz and President Biden made it clear. They reiterated the kind of, of massive sanctions, of economic sanctions that would be applied against uh, Russia should there be any kind of border incursion. So I think that right now uh, Mr. Putin is weighing his options. And I think it would be a massive mistake for him to, to, um, to, 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 attack, to attack Ukraine. Um, at the same time, he feels, Russia feels, that the West is, is goading it. That's what the Russians say, that uh, the, the movement of uh, the, the, the West toward the Russian border, um, opening the, I, the possibility um, of a Ukrainian entry into NATO, uh, the Russians see as a threat. And they've been pretty clear about that for 25 years. Uh, it's clear that the Russians have felt very ill at ease about NATO's expansion. They've said it again and again. In 2008, then, uh, NATO opened up the possibility of membership for Georgia and Ukraine. It was another step in the direction of Russia, obviously something it feels very uncomfortable with. Um, I don't think that they're going to go to war for that. 
simply because at the moment, uh, paradoxically, I mean, NATO membership in Ukraine is not in the cards. I mean, nobody in NATO thinks that Ukraine qualifies for membership in NATO. And it, as for the Ukraine, it's embedded in their constitution that they cannot join NATO. So uh, it's, 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 it's very unclear at the moment uh, how great the military threat is. But we certainly have to take Mr. Putin at his word. It is possible. So, Pavel, it's interesting because Paul says uh, the West is goading Russia. And, and I heard an analyst from Russia earlier this week saying, no, uh, the take from Putin is that uh, the West is ignoring uh, Russia, that this has been something that he's been talking about for some, some time, very annoyed about the NATO expansion, and that uh, the West has ignored him. And he knows if he moves troops to the border, suddenly a conversation can can occur, which it is now. Uh, is this a case of brinkmanship just to get dialogue going? What's the take there in Moscow? Well, yes, there's a lot of talk that this is brinkmanship. The Russian official position is that Russia has no intention whatsoever to invade Ukraine or begin a war. Uh, but as they said in NATO headquarters, it was rather popular during the Cold War, intentions uh, can change overnight. What should be discussed really is uh, capabilities. And so if you look really at the capabilities and not so much about intentions, uh, because the capabilities are for, there for a possible uh, serious escalation. That's possible. The, the readiness of the Russian forces, all of them, is at very heightened levels. Not only those that, that are close to Ukraine, but in the entire country, including the strategic nuclear forces, uh, land-based and sea-based and air-based, and there's the movement of forces there. And there's a movement of forces in the West, and the Americans began also moving forces to Poland and Romania, and more can follow. Uh, and there is a standoff uh, forming in the Mediterranean between the Russian Navy and Air Force based in uh, Syria and uh, a NATO grouping of three uh, aircraft carriers, American, French, and Italian, and other ships there. So nothing can, now can be excluded. It's a very dangerous situation. And uh, more should be done to really try and de-escalate it, because during the Cold War, such things were actually always very seriously treated and very seriously de-escalated. All right. So, Einar, uh, President Xi just hosted uh, Putin in Beijing for the Winter Olympics. He was there for that. But they also had a range of discussions. They came out with a statement. What's China's take on this? Well, I mean, China has uh, explicitly said that they are concerned about NATO's expansion. They did not mention Ukraine in the joint communique, uh, but nor did they uh, really mention, uh, you know, this kind of intervention. As uh, everybody knows, uh, China has a very firm policy line about non-intervention in the affairs of other countries. I think that's uh, something that people should keep in mind. And also, you know, the, the language uh, in the joint communique in terms of discussing Taiwan was also pretty tight. Nothing new uh, from uh, the Russian side. I think at this juncture, uh, China is concerned that the U.S. is pushing buttons on two fronts. Uh, it is trying to encircle uh, Russia at the same time as it's trying to encircle China, both with the aims of suppressing them to maintain American hegemony. And that's the view from Beijing. And, Paul, French President uh, Macron just visited Moscow, then went off to Kiev, held a news conference there. He seemed pretty upbeat, though, at the news conference with the Ukrainian president, uh, said there's a chance to make these negotiations between Russia and Ukraine move forward. Uh, give me your sense of, of whether or not he can be kind of a deal maker in a sense. Well, I think that he obviously is. He stepped into a vacuum in European diplomacy. I mean, until now, uh, most of the diplomacy has gone on between uh, Moscow and Washington, uh, leaving Europe, the European Union, and Ukraine out of the equation, so that he's reinserted uh, your, your mainland Europe in, into negotiations is, is absolutely positive. And he's obviously been extremely busy talking five hours yesterday with, with, with Putin today in Ukraine. Uh, obviously, what we want is a diplomatic negotiated solution to this entire problem. 
uh, it's, it is the case that um, you know, Russia has demanded, wants an, a new security architecture. And I think that uh, perhaps Macron, better than anybody else, would be the person to, to, to propose something. He's long been self been, been critical of NATO, harshly critical. He's for a European defense and, and security architecture, uh, which is you know, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a quality much different than what we've had in the past. And perhaps he could open this up and include Ukraine and, and Russia in some kind of security agreement that it doesn't doesn't divide Europe, but brings Europe together. Pavel, that sounds pretty good. Do, do you see the Kremlin kind of embracing a new security architecture? What's the view there on these talks with Macron? Uh, well, the talks happened. It's been uh, important and seen as a. Uh, Putin spent a lot of time with him. Of course, the Kremlin said that reports that there was some kind of deal reached are wrong, uh, most likely so. Uh, the problem with, of course, Macron is that he uh, does not have the capability to force neither the United States nor actually Ukraine. Uh, to uh, move in Russian directions. He can't force Russia, really, to move in any direction. Uh, so he can be a go-between, but he cannot really be a real broker because he, uh, France does not have the capabilities to be a real broker. That's why Russia has been insisting that only an agreement with the United States could really be a, a agreement that could stick where Russia could find uh, guarantees, at least tacit guarantees, maybe, and hopefully not tacit, but legal guarantees that NATO will not expand, that uh, Russian uh, opinions and Russian red lines will be taken into account. I don't see how Macron can actually make that happen on his own, uh, but he's trying, which is, a, of course, better than not trying. Uh, Jack, I saw you nodding your head. I want to get your thoughts on this. I, well, first of all, on the Macron issue, I, I don't. I agree that Macron simply does not have the standing to broker the, the necessary deal, and we, we probably ought to look at these dialogues that he's engaged in through the lens of French domestic politics. He faces an election in the spring uh, and uh, wants to be seen as powerful and influential in Europe. Uh, to me, the key next step, and it's a costless step for the American side, uh, and potentially for NATO, would simply be to express the view that NATO's expansion, which has encompassed the Baltic states, Romania, Hungary, Poland, is over. That kind of statement could, provi uh, could provide some pressure release uh, at this point, and it should be emphasized, costs NATO and costs America nothing. The, the likelihood that NATO troops would ever be stationed in Ukraine in the way that they are in Poland or Hungary or Romania or the Baltics, that likelihood is zero. For NATO to expand into Ukraine would mean that, that Ukraine gets a U.S. nuclear guarantee and that American troops and perhaps even more emotionally German troops could be exercising and permanently based in Ukraine. For Putin to allow that to happen would be to end his authority in Russia. He couldn't do it. And, he could not live with that situation. Okay, just let me jump in here for a second because you said it costs nothing. If it costs nothing, why isn't it happening? Well, uh, you know, at some point, U.S. domestic politics and NATO internal politics have intruded here. NATO has, has continued an expansion campaign uh, in recent years. And at the heart of that uh, is the ability to sell military equipment, to, pro, uh, to uh, create forward bases, to establish intelligence capability. All of those things make some tactical sense. But once you talk about Ukraine, the strategic sense of an expansion of NATO disappears. Insecurity increases in Russia, and no additional security is provided to NATO. It's important to remember that the last time Ukraine was invaded by foreign troops, 
Those troops were German, and the result was 7 million dead Russians, 700 burned cities, and 10 million homeless people. That's in living memory. No Russian leader can tolerate the presence of foreign troops in Ukraine. I believe that that's an existential issue for Mr. Putin, and one that, if forced, uh, he would go to war for. Well, so I, let's de-escalate. Yeah. Let's simply de-escalate. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Einer, let me ask you about NATO, because it was created to counter the Soviet Union after World War II. But in the 90s, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. It was gone. Does it make sense that this military alliance still exists? I mean, there are those who question it, including the former president of the United States, Donald Trump. Well, yeah, that's always been the question. I mean, this is a group that, uh, through sheer, sheer inertia, continues on. It's in search of a mission. It's uh, talked about, you know, all the things it could do, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, in, in the absence of a, a real army in the, you know, either in the EU or individually, uh, it's kind of stood in for there. But I would agree with my, my colleague, Jack, when he says that this is... Uh, you know, an unthinkable situation. It's not clear why um, Washington is kind of hanging its hat on this other than uh, for domestic politics. Uh, but, you know, at this time, you know, NATO is, has become the problem. It is not uh, the problem solver. And, Paul, uh, let me ask you about an analyst from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He was quoted in Financial Times as saying, Biden's just trying to keep maximum pressure on allies to take this Russian threat seriously. What is the view in, in Europe? I mean, the, the relationship between Europe and the United States fractured uh, during the Trump administration. It started to go their own way. I mean, how do they view the U.S. pressuring them on this? Well, I... I don't think that the United States is pressuring the Europeans to such an extent that they feel uncomfortable with it. We have on Ukraine's borders hundreds of thousands of troops and a, a very aggressive and obviously unhappy uh, Mr. Putin who has invaded Ukraine and Georgia in the past and very recently. So, if anything, this whole situation has caused to unite uh, the United States and, and the Western Europeans in a way that actually they haven't been united before in, 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 qu in quite some time. So, in this sense, this is just another example of how this, these moves have, have worked against Russia and, and could continue to as well. So it's not it's not resentment. I mean, I think that there's a, a more allegiance and solidarity right now across the Atlantic that, than there ever has been before. And I think that the, the United States and and Germany and France and the EU countries are, are trying trying to figure this out together. I mean, they realize that um, that that Putin has been trying to destabilize the European Union and fracture the, the transatlantic relationship for some time. That's absolutely obvious. I mean, he's 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 aggressive. He's militaristic. Uh, he's um, you know increasingly unpopular at home. Uh, and so, I mean, the situation is an extremely dangerous one. It's done a world to bring Europe and the United States more together than they've been in a long, long time. Pavel, I want to get your take on, on what he just said. Uh, well, that would be not uh, wrong to say that Putin is unpopular at home. He is quite popular, and uh, the Russian public actually will... Of course, no one wants a war, that's obvious, uh, but uh, the, the present crisis is seen by most Russians as coming from the West, as, as the Western... Uh, pressure, Western ag aggression, as it's seen, Western the NATO expansion. So uh, the Russian public right now basically is behind the Kremlin. Uh, though, of course, if there's a really war happening and if it's going to go wrong, that could change the situation internally uh, dramatically. But right now, uh, Putin the Russian leadership, uh, are supported. Uh, but you should also understand that their 
the readership itself is not that united, that there are those inside the Kremlin and inside the Russian military even who are not totally happy with what is happening, believe that this is a grave risk, is a risky situation, that a war, uh, ex ex uh, kind of an escalation with Ukraine or an escalation actually into an all-European war would be disastrous. Uh, so there is a party of peace and a kind of party of more a war inside Russia. Putin is kind of moderating between them, and he is uh, the moderator-in-chief, and he's going to be making, of course, the final decision on will we kind of, will there be further escalation, or right now we're going to have uh, some standing down, because he can't keep forces on such a heightened state of readiness indefinitely. Uh, Jack, the United States not just talking about imminent war at the State Department. Uh, there was this idea floated that there might be a false flag operation that uh, Russia could use as a pretext to actually launch a, a military advance into Ukraine. That led to an exchange with an AP reporter. Let's watch a little bit of that. You don't have any, any evidence to back it up other than what you're saying. What is the evidence that you have that suggests that, that, that the Russians are even planning this? But you just come out and say this and expect us just to, to, to believe it without you showing a shred of evidence that it's actually true. Jack, what do you make of this exchange? I, I think it was a very unfortunate uh, move by the U.S. government to do this kind of uh, fact-free speculation about Mr. Putin's motives or tactics. You know, in 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when Kennedy went in front of the American people uh, and explained the, the gravity of the situation, uh, he showed photographs, he put the evidence up, and then he shut up and got on with the quiet business of diplomacy. And I think there's a strong case to be made for less to be said in public now uh, and more work to be done in private. You know, while we pay attention to Mr. Putin, I think the real chess player here is the Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov, who has played this situation brilliantly. Uh, he has caused the United States to directly threaten to cut off the energy supplies uh, to Western Europe. That is the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which was finished last September, it's still not running. That puts the German economy, puts all of the European economies at risk, and to do that, all that Lavrov and Putin had to do was put troops on the border of Ukraine. This is a very sophisticated diplomatic game that's being played, uh, and the time now is for quiet diplomacy and some careful thinking about strategic interests, not this kind of public posturing that we've seen in recent days. I think it was a very unfortunate uh, decision by the administration. Einer, I want to get your take on this exchange between the AP reporter and the, the sports spokesman at the uh, State Department. As uh, Jack just de described it, fact-free speculation. Uh, what's your view? Well, I'm, I'm glad there's somebody who's willing to ask those questions. Too bad it's uh, not in terms of the COVID conspiracies and uh, all the other things about, uh, you know, everything uh, from everything from Xinjiang to um, uh, Hong Kong. Uh, you know, it's this. This is the most important thing that the the press can do is to hold uh, these people uh, accountable. You know, what are you presenting? Please give us uh, some facts, figures that we can check, and things like this. Uh, without that, it's just uh, disinformation campaigns pushing policy uh, decisions generally made because of they want to get reelected. So at this time, uh, I applaud the journalist, uh, and I'm a little uh, taken back uh, by this idea that. Uh, you know, people are still running around trying to support these policies by saying that the U.S. and Europe are united. You've just heard two very different views. One saying, oh, yes, the U.S. and Europe are united. Uh, the other one saying the U.S. has basically threatened to cut off uh, Europe's uh, gas supplies. I don't know how they can be in sync. It's either one or the other. Uh, Einer, one final follow-up question. Uh, what do you think it's going to take to kind of reach the off-ramp, de-escalate, uh, and, and see our way past this? Well, it, it, they can't join uh, NATO. It, I think it, it takes somebody, uh, maybe perhaps Macron, saying, look, you know, in order for anyone to join NATO, it has to be unanimous uh, invitation by all parties within NATO. I guarantee that uh, France will not will stand in the way of any of that. That's one possibility. I, I can't see the U.S. backing down on anything substantial. It'd have to be bypassed on this particular thing. But there would be a sigh of relief on that side.
All right, gentlemen, thanks so much. Really enjoyed uh, chatting with all of you. Really appreciate it. That's it for this conversation. But the conversation continues online. Chat with us about this or any other show on Twitter. We're at CGTN America or visit us on Facebook. That's Facebook.com slash CGTN America. I'm Mike Walter in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for being with us.